Proving fundamental theorems about prime numbers and their distributions using elementary group theory approaches. We'll index the primes with the normal ordering, but we start at zero. So we say one is a prime. It doesn't matter, it's index zero. It doesn't show up in any count formulas. The primorial is to primes as the factorial is to the naturals. It's the product of all the primes less than or equal to some mth prime. This has a natural recursive form. The next primorial is equal to the next prime times the current primorial. Next notice, uh, we can index from zero without any loss of generality. We can generalize this by using offsets and introduce the primorial minor for which we use a superscript, uh, minus superscript. That is, we subtract r from every prime before we multiply it. This also has a natural recursive form, though not as attractive. Um, and notice it draws down the, uh, the, the offset into the, the, the algebraic form. The proof follows trivially by adding nothing. It's a common trick. Um, you see in, in the middle step we've done that. Following the normal rule for factorials, if the value before the operator evaluates to zero, the result becomes one. That is, zero factorial equals one. Or, our minor primorial equals one when our prime is equal to the offset. If the offset is larger than, uh, uh, the, the primorial is undefined for any prime uh, less than the offset. We also define the jth primorial multiplicative moment as our primorial divided by some prime less than our index for obvious reasons. And the jth primorial additive moment uh, as plus or minus uh, the, our particular prime. These can be further generalized by using any unique sequence of primes less than our, our current. For example, 11 primorial equals uh, 11 primorial divided by 7 by 3 is, is the 7 by 3 primorial multiplicative minor moment. We now introduce a general model of prime sieving with a small twist on the usual sieve of Aristotle's. Instead of choosing a random limit n, we choose n to be a primorial. We also always begin with the smallest primorial and grow our memory to our target size as needed. We call this the S model, or multiplication modulo n, along the primorials with its differences and variations applied to the study of the distribution of prime number of gaps. Bit of a mouthful. We use multiplication modulo n for a number of reasons, including periodicity, and that the set size, determined from Euler's Totian function, is the very trivial first minor primorial. You're going to see that these minor primorials generate a, a, an algebra that describe, describes the structure of everything. Instead of writing the usual Zn, we denote our set as Sm, S for sieve, M for a current index, such that N is equal to our primorial. And we use an infinite number of rows, as many as, as you can draw. We use zero-based index, so our largest index is our minor, minor primorial minus one. And the top row is our co-prime members identified by the M superscript without the minus sign. Each following row is the nth difference where N is, uh, tells us the row number. We name the second row the gap row for obvious reasons, and the following rows coalescence rows because, as we'll see, Gap pairs, triples, etc. sometimes coalesce into new gaps and tuples, etc. The average gap, denoted by GM, is by definition our primorial divided by the count of elements or our minor primorial, the Euler product. It's trivial to demonstrate the average of any t uh, tuple of length n gaps is simply n times the average. Hint, cycle the set by n and add it to itself. This is trivial because our sets are periodic. That is, we have a strong indication that the main driving term for the distribution of the primes is locally linear on some scale. 
our first who ordered that observation. We're going to use this to prove by construction that the log integral is indeed the best model for the distribution of the primes. We'll also show that given the PNT, the prime number theorem, and Chebyshev's function, the Riemann hypothesis was effectively proved. All that's been missing is the context, and what follows is that context. However, only to prove the Riemann hypothesis does a great disservice to the S model. The S model provides a wonderfully deep collection of insights into the distribution of prime numbers and general properties of multiplication. Before we reach the Riemann hypothesis, we'll prove the general Hardy-Littlewood gap conjectures, introduce another Chebyshev function, and more. Before we continue, we're going to show you a striking feature of prime gap distributions that should surprise even the most seasoned mathematician. It follows as a direct, direct result of our proof of the Riemann zeta conjecture. Since every reader's mathematical childhood, we have been taught the following as dogma, in the most part because it's exactly true. Randomly sample 500 primes from the first million or so. Find the next prime and take the difference or the gap. Divide the gap by the log of the prime and add it to a sum. At the end, take the average, and it should be very close to 1. This is just a restatement of the prime number theorem. The average gap around a prime is its logarithm. Now repeat the experiment, but with a twist. Take your random prime, but square it first. Now find the ne nearest prime less than their square. Find its next neighbor and determine the gap. Divide it by the log of your random prime and sum them together. As before, take the average at the end. Since we are measuring gaps at the square of our prime, we expect 2 in accordance with the prime number theorem. That is the log of 2 t telling us it's been squared. Or the, the log being 2 tells us it's been squared. Your average will be 4 and very close to it. Perform the experiment one or two primes away from your square and your average will be near two. Check exactly at the square and it's twice the expected value. We will prove this by construction as most of our proofs are done. This isn't so much to settle Riemann's question, but to demonstrate the simplicity, elegance and power of the S model. By the way, the answer is the worst possible case between pi of x and the log integral of x is the square root of x over log x. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We first begin by connecting the S model to the prime number theorem via Merton's theorem from 1850, which in our notation is very elegant. It's uh, our average gap divided by our prime is tending to Euler, uh, e to the gamma, Euler's constant. That is, our average gap behaves asymptotically as uh, e to the gamma times the log of the prime. Noting the first non-trivial member of an arbitrary S model is the next prime, naively counting members would violate the prime number theorem unless we pre-multiply our counts with e to the gamma as follows. So cancelling our set um, uh, allows us to cancel our e to the gamma and it return, gives us numbers we're expecting. Without the Merton scale factor, we would find the proper forms, but our counts would systematically drift. Next, we show another elegant reason for choosing the S model as our prime distribution probe. Given a particular iteration of the model M, we can trivially construct the next model by expanding memory to the next primordial boundary and removing our next non co prime members as follows, which is just what we've stated. We're using uh, our next prime copies of the gaps, expand them to find our co primes, and then remove our next prime times our current co prime members as uh, the next set of composites. We've already expanded our memory and it's been perceived through our current prime, so we save a lot. And here we're just restating our primor simple primordial algebra. <coughs> um, by following this strategy, we do a form of just-in-time sieving and memory allocation. 
Since we store only the gaps, everything is compressed, giving us a nice improvement in speed. Next we show we can double the speed due to a remarkable internal symmetry by proving the gaps form a palindrome of length of a set minus one. This is remarkable. Only have to do half the work. Assuming m is bigger than one, or the prime is bigger than two, we note that our primordial plus or minus one is either a member of our set or its residuals. That is, the last gap of every such model is a twin, and we call this the capping twin. Next, we note our primordial divided by two, plus or minus two, these moments we were talking about, is also, are also members of our set. And since we can't have pairs of twins, it implies the existence of a gap of four, and we call this the pivotal cousin. It'll be obvious in a moment. Finally, we note that since our primordial plus or minus any member is also a member of our set or its residuals, we can do some simple gap algebra on either side of the pivotal cousin, and a little counting will satisfy you that the palindrome exists. That is, the sequence of gaps is a set of two large sets of length, our minor primordial divided by two minus one, just less than half the set size each the reverse image of the other. And together with the pivotal cousin and the capping twin, we finish our set. Use the first calculated set to fill the first units of memory, add a pivotal cousin, reverse the set, and fill in the next units of memory. Polish it off with your capping twin, and you have your gap sequence with exactly the right expected length. That is, we only ever need to calculate halfway through each iteration of the model and let the internal symmetry do the rest of the work. Amazing! Who ordered that? Now we'll talk about gap survivorship. How the patterns are going to survive from one iteration to the next. Given an iteration M migrating through the next set kills off composites of the next prime. We call this step the construction of the construction given a construction. It's all constructive but we like to call it the Composite Killing Machine, or CKM. So let's talk about this gap survival ship. The easiest way to consider this is to follow individual gaps through the process of expansion and coalescence. Individuals, remember this. We begin by making our next prime copies of each, each one of these. And for each one of these, this, there are next prime copies, and two must die. This is because a gap is actually a pair of co-prime members. The consumption of a co-prime, now discovered to be composite, kills two gaps, to the left and to the right, which it had been anchoring. Another way to see this is looking back at our earlier notation, every one of these columns must die. And when a column dies, it produces a new gap in the coalescence row. <coughs> or Every individual gap having two anchors has two ways to die. This generalizes to gap pairs and tuples of length up to our next prime minus one. That is, gap pairs have three ways to die, triples four, and in general, a tuple of length n has n plus one ways to die. So we have another general rule. For every gap tuple of length r minus one, and for all r between 2 and our next prime minus 1, our next prime minus r tuples will survive. It's clear now that we can develop a relationship between a primordial minor algebra and gap counting, which we explore in our next lecture.